Hi, my name is Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote. This podcast has been brought to you by the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. To learn more, visit www.thecgo.org. It is my pleasure to have Sarah Squire on today. She's a fellow, she's a senior fellow at Liberty Fund and the author of the college writing textbook, Writing a Thesis, Writing with a Thesis, and she has a PhD in English from the University of Chicago. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, Juliet. Thank you so much for having me. The reason I mention your degree, Sarah, is that you are not only the first woman on my podcast, but you are also the first of my interviewees who holds a PhD in English literature. It seems that you were an oddity because there aren't many free market English PhDs around. Am I correct about that? And if so, why do you think that is? I, I think that there's more than you think. Um, I certainly know and work with um, several uh, literature professors who have a strong interest in the free market and in the ideals of liberty. Um, I think that it is often not front and center in their work just by virtue of what it is that they're teaching and reading about. But um, I think that I think that there's more more people out there than than one might expect there to be. So before we dive into the interview itself, I want to ask you a question that I ask all my guests. What is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Well, this is a really good question. Um, and I have two daughters who are just a little bit younger than you are. Um, my older daughter is almost 15 um, and my younger daughter is 12. So we're talking really about the generation of, of my kids. Um, the first thing is that I've learned never to underestimate what you guys already know. Um, I am constantly surprised by what you know and what you have taught yourselves. Um, my kids are always demonstrating new skills that they just learned by watching things on YouTube or picked up um, in, in various ways. My my 12 year old helped me recall, uh, um, record a stop motion video the other day. I have no idea how she learned how to do it, but she had no problem. I, I had no idea, but there you go. But one of the things that I do think that I would like um, folks from your generation to know and to really embrace is the importance of knowing history and of knowing the past. Um, to quote Battlestar Galactica and also Peter Pan, all of this has happened before and all of it will happen again. Um, if you know your history and if you have studied and read a lot of history and a lot of literature from a variety of time periods and places, things that are happening in your current moment will surprise you less, will frighten you less, and will have a lot less control over the decisions that you make. I think that's a really good thing that a lot of people should listen to. That's very insightful. Thank you. Now, now I want to turn to one of the prevailing misconceptions in the free market movement, which is that Western literature doesn't really care for markets. They cite works like The Merchant of Venice or The Christmas Carol or Writings of Dickens to prove how classic books misrepresent markets and they give capitalists, I say this loosely, a bad name. Mm -hmm. But in your essay for Cato Unbound in 2012, you made the case that this isn't the way it is. I particularly like the part where you say that it's because people tend to read the same works by the authors as opposed to reading all of their works. Basically, you write, quote, there's a whole lot going on unexplored. And you urge people to, quote, to stop reading the same things that everyone else is reading. Can you make, the, can you make your case to us? Sure. Um, I think one of the things that happens, uh, particularly for people who are working on literature from outside a literature department, right? If I'm an economist um, 
And I'm not talking smack about economists. I'm extremely fond of them. I like them so much. I married one. Uh, I'm a big fan. But uh, if I were an economist looking to bring in a little bit of literature into my classroom, say if I wanted to bring in a little bit of Shakespeare, I might Google the terms Shakespeare and economics or Shakespeare and money. That's going to bring up a lot of discussions of Merchant of Venice, right? Merchant of Venice has a very negative portrayal throughout most of it of uh, market exchange and of people who engage in market exchange. Um, but there are other plays by Shakespeare and particularly other poems by Shakespeare, Shakespeare's sonnets uh, most especially, that have a much more positive portrayal of market exchanges, right? You're not necessarily going to come across those by just Googling the terms Shakespeare and economics though. You have to be willing to read uh, broadly inside his work in order to discover those things for yourself. Um, the same is true of Dickens, right? If you Google Dickens and economics, you're going to get A Christmas Carol, which has the famously negative portrayal of, of uh, economics and of capitalism in uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. And you'll probably get um, a, a Hard Times uh, as well. Um, but you're not going to get uh, probably Bleak House, um, which has some very pro-market and pro-entrepreneurship um, uh, and innovation messages in it, right? For that, you have to dig a little bit deeper. You have to not look in the same places that everybody else is looking. Um, so I'm in high school and mm -hmm. my English teacher this year is the best. He's always pushing us to read more than what's assigned to us, more than what is classic and what everyone across the country is reading all over the world, even. Right. Um, I like I them feel like <laughs> I feel like everyone is reading the same thing. And even when students are asked to choose their own book, their choice novel to read, they choose something that is considered a classic that everyone knows. But as you say in your essay, and as you've said already, there's so much more out there. Why aren't we looking at it? Why is it hard to find this? Well, I, I mean, I think for your fellow students, part of the challenge is when your teacher asks you to read something, right? You want to pick something that kind of signals your um, intellectual awesomeness and your investment in serious literature and stuff like that. So you might not be inclined to pick up, um, you know, a, a current, uh, a contemporary romance novel. Um, or a contemporary work of science fiction, you might instead feel like, oh, well, I really ought to read Jane Austen, or I really ought to read uh, Joseph Conrad, or, you know, some kind of, you know, established and important novel to kind of prove that I'm the kind of student who reads those. So there's that kind of social pressure. Um, but I think, you know, we also really like to talk about books with other people who've read the same book. All right. If we're if we're geeky book people, which I think you and I both are, um, yeah. we like to read books and then talk about them with people who have read the same books. And so, you know, if all of your friends are reading, I don't know, um, Cinder, uh, or if everybody's reading the George Martin uh, Song of Fire and Ice, um, series right everybody's gonna anyone who hasn't is gonna kind of want to get in on the game so they can be part of that discussion right mm -hmm. and that you know that's there are economists who can talk about that better right but there's a great great economics book uh called uh, extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds which is about our tendency to sort of do things want to do things in groups want to do things at the same time as everybody else. So there's, you know, there's some signaling that goes on with that. There's some desire for a community. Um, but then there's also, there's just so much stuff to choose from. There's so, I mean, there's so many books out there that it's hard to know what to read and, and where to go to find something cool and interesting that might also be untrodden territory. In your essay, you write that, quote, literature is not for clear answer answers. Literature is for complicated questions. There's a vital empirical data in literary texts, not data about economic facts, though there's some of that as well, but data about how people felt and thought and wrote about economic and market issues, end quote. I think I know what you mean. This year, I've been asked to dissect crime and punishment to an, ex to an extent that I never thought I'd be able to, that I never mm -hmm. thought you could with any work. 
And yet, the more I read a single paragraph, a single line, the more I see something that I didn't see at first. And when I talk to my friends, I'm kind of amazed at how they don't see what I've seen. But don't we risk projecting our own understanding or our own conceptions of that world into a book that we read? We absolutely do. And I think, you know, I think the encounter with literature is about both those things, right? It's about turning to a novel or a poem to understand what that novel or that poem or that play is telling us about the world that it knows, right? So we can read, uh, we can read a Jane Austen novel. I happen to be working on a piece on Pride and Prejudice right now, so it's sitting on my desk, right? We can read Pride and Prejudice, right? And learn from it a lot about what people in Austen's time thought was economically important, about what they thought good moral decision-making looked like, right? About what they thought was important when choosing um, a husband or a wife, about how they thought character was formed, right? So we can learn, and we can learn, um, you know, the difference between different kinds of carriages that people would ride or the different kinds of gowns that ladies would wear, right? We can learn all sorts of very um, embedded historical contextual details, right? About issues from, from sort of fashion uh, and, and commercial culture all of the way up through philosophical issues of the day, right? So we can do that. And that's a really important way to um, interact with a literary work. Another way equally important to interact with a literary work is to say, what does this work tell me about where I am and about what I, what questions I have and about what my life is like, right? What do Elizabeth Bennett's uh, mistakes and misinterpretations and, and discoveries have to do with my understanding of my life and the mistakes that I might make in judging people, right? You can read, you can do both of those things and a bunch of other stuff when you encounter a work of literature. And a really good work of literature is going to invite you to do all of those things all at the same time. Hmm. Um, that's, that's how people can spend an entire life on one play, <laughs> right? Or, or one novel or, you know, a, a series of small poems by, by one poet because they just keep, they keep opening up and they keep opening up. Can you give us an example of your favorite pro-market novel? Also, what is a famous novel or short story that you think is the most misunderstood? Oh, those are good questions. Um, I'm very bad at answering questions about my favorite novel or my favorite poem or my favorite play because I start listing and then like three hours later, people remind me I was only supposed to give them one. Um, <laughs> so, so few then. <laughs> so a couple of... A, a couple of Novels that I think are, and I'm going to stick just with novels. We're going to keep it to one genre. A couple of novels that I think are marvelous with uh, that have great economic content. So these are going to be the novels that I jump up and down and yell at economists until they read. Um, the first of them is Red Plenty by Francis Spufford. Um, and this is a, it's a modern novel it's written in like 2010 or 11, something like that. Um, and this is a book that's about one third economic history, one third uh, history of uh, the Soviet Union before uh, before breakup, and one third fiction. Um, so it's sort of a historical and economic fiction all combined, um, and it's about the the Soviet Union from about 1930 through the death of Khrushchev. Um, and it's glorious. Um, I'm one definitely of the, going to read that. Yeah, it's spectacular. <laughs> um, it's one of, I think, the best uh, examples I can think of of a work of literature that allows you to enter the minds of people that are very, very far from your own. Right. So if you have the reason I make econ I like to make economists read it um, is because um particularly economists, free market economists, tend to look at the Soviet project, right? The, the um, 
collectivist kind of uh, economic planning uh, part of the the Soviet project as being so wrongheaded from the beginning that it's almost impossible to understand how any person of intelligence or goodwill could have fallen for the big swindle, right? And what mm-hmm. Spufford is so great at is that without falling for the big swindle, he's able to explain how people could and to, to very clearly get you inside the minds of people who begin the novel really believing that they can solve poverty and they can eliminate scarcity and that we're, we're a mathematical equation away from plenty for all. And I think that's a re- remarkable piece of work he does. That um, sounds so interesting. It's great. <laughs> it's a whole it's a whole senior year project for you. Um, uh, another novel that I'm recommending a lot lately, um, and we just uh, did um, a discussion on it um, at the um, uh, Library of Economics and Liberty uh, uh, Facebook page uh, over at Liberty Fund. Um, is a book called The Mandibles by a novelist named Lionel Shriver. And The Mandibles is an alternate future history of the US. So it's sort of science fiction. It's, it's futurist, um, no spaceships or anything. But it, it uh, the thought experiment is a perfect storm of economic collapse within the US. Um, Hmm. and what happens afterwards. And it's glorious and it's enormously free market in its leanings. And this is a case where the more you know about economic history, the better the book is because she's drawing from very specific moments in uh, in economic history and kind of running them out to to their logical extremes. Um, And it's beautifully written and it's really grim. um, And it's just a great read. I will definitely check that out also because that sounds interesting too. <laughs> the list of books I have to read like for the rest of quarantine is just growing. <laughs> and growing. So now I want to switch gears and talk about women in government. Back yes. in 2016, you wrote a fascinating two-part essay at Learn Liberty called How, How the State Became the American Woman's Real Enemy. And you start the essay by writing, quote, I've been a feminist for as long as I remember. I've been a libertarian for nearly as long, probably ever since I cheerfully moved into a nine by 10 closet spare bedroom in order to protect my privacy and property rights from my younger sister, end quote. Having shared a room with my younger sister, I can totally relate to that. (laughs) You then go on to explain the many ways that the feminist movement has often pointed to men as the worst enemy of women and turned to government to protect them against and from men. You explained that this might have been an unfortunate distraction since the government itself is no friend of women. You write, quote, baked right into the government cake, scrambled into the government omelet are all the assumptions we most need to be rid of in order to be free and flourishing individuals, end quote. Can you explain what you mean by that? And can you give us some examples about how historically the state has been against women's interest in their actions? Oh, sure. Um, the, the, so the, the piece that you're referring to is uh, extracted from a longer talk um, called uh, Women Need the State Like a Fish Needs a Bicycle. Um, and uh, <laughs> I love that title. I just had to get that in there. Um, in that talk, I, I use... Uh, the history of the labor movement, uh, the tax code, and occupational licensing uh, as examples of three ways in which the state cracks down on women's economic liberty. Um, so, do, so to do those extremely quickly and off the top of my head, so if you get letters um, from people complaining that that I'm, I'm being very, very surface on this, I do apologize, but I'm aware we have limited time. Um, so unions... Um, were formed initially in order to protect the rights of people who already had jobs. And primarily they were formed in order to protect the rights of white married American men 
against an influx of immigrant labor and against uh, the competition of women's labor. Um, so this means a bunch of things. Um, one of the things it means uh, is that uh, the labor movement um, was able to do things like agitate for equal pay for women performing men's work. Now that sounds like that would be a really good thing for women, right? But because on the margin, employers were less excited about hiring women and often uh, women might not have had the same level of experience or expertise at a job as a male employee uh, might have had because women were relatively new to a lot of sectors in the labor market, employer, employers weren't willing to pay as much for female labor. So by agitating for equal pay for women um, in the early days uh, of the unions, uh, they were cutting out huge swaths of, of, of women from being employed. Um, unions also, under the guise of protecting, um, protecting women's health and uh, safety, would argue against things like uh, women uh, cleaning offices at night or working in laundries. This is a very famous case about, um, about women's work in, in laundries. Um, it's fine, apparently, for women to clean at home and to do laundry at home at any hour of the day uh, and not make money for it. But the minute that they would go outside the home uh, and do laundry or clean an office, if it was happening at night, it's right out. Totally unacceptable. And we had to put a cap on that kind of labor. And you see this sort of thing happen over and over and over again. And what is so often the case is that it's presented as being protective of women. Um, well, what it really is doing is just cutting them out of the labor market. So it's doing two things at once, cutting them out of the labor market and also presenting them as uniquely uh, weak and feeble and in need of government protection. Right. So there's so, in, in the course in the court case about uh, the laundries. Um, I'm sorry. There's a whole argument made that, like, because women have babies, they shouldn't be required to do. They shouldn't be permitted to do this kind of heavy, heavy work and this kind of heavy labor. And therefore, the government has a right to and a responsibility to protect them from this kind of labor, which is, you know, appalling. That's. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of disappointing to hear. Uh, I don't like that. <laughs> so how about the right to vote? That came really late for women. Uh, it did um, in 1920. I mean, I think I happen to think that the right to vote is really important. <laughs> uh, I don't want anyone telling me that I absolutely must vote. Um, but I sure as hell don't want anybody telling me that I'm not allowed to. And I really don't want anybody telling me how I have to vote or how I ought to vote because I'm a woman. Um, I do think that when the uh, women's movement became almost entirely focused on women's suffrage as the be all end all goal for the women's movement, they lost track of the need to um, pursue equality in other areas as well, right? So that everything was sacrificed in order to work for women's suffrage. Um, and we lost track of things like the labor movement. We lost track of things like the tax code, right? Where um, various provisions are put into place. I'm not gonna go into it at great length because your, your listeners probably mostly don't pay taxes yet. Um, and it will be very boring. But the tax code is stacked against secondary earners if you have a married couple. Generally, generally, uh, in a uh, in a traditional in a in a marriage between a man and a woman, generally the woman earns less money than the man. It's not always the case. Um, that secondary earner is taxed um, their their taxes begin uh, to be applied at the highest rate. Their, the first dollar of their money is taxed at the highest rate of the last dollar of their partners. Um, my, I'm I'm waving my arms around as if you can see me and as if that will somehow ex 
help me explain the tax code over a podcast. I'm going to leave it. Suffice it to say, secondary earners who are generally women are uh, heavily penalized by the current tax code. And that's a real problem. And it's something that we have let, uh, let go for far too long. So I've heard that early pioneer feminists like Mary Wollstonecraft were ardent laissez-faire liberals and supporters of capitalist industry. They understood that their ability to earn money outside of marriage was the key to their independence from men. Can you tell us a little about these women or why the feminist movements changed? Well, I think I think the change comes really with that with that turn to the focus on uh, getting suffrage. Sort of, narr- I think that 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 turn comes really with that turn towards uh, that full bore focus on women's suffrage. We lose track of a lot of the concerns of um, earlier 18th century feminists like Mary Wollstonecraft, um, as you mentioned. Um, and and some others. Um, I have written uh, a piece um, on a great uh, 17th century feminist named Margaret Fell, who is married to George Fox, and they they found the Quaker movement, um, which uh, you know begins in England and really takes off in the United States. Um, and uh, Margaret Fell was a huge proponent of women's right to um, speak in church, to preach the gospel to own property um, and a host of other uh, considerations. And we've sort of lost track of some of these early feminists and the things that they cared about as well because of the the focus on uh, sort of the outward signs of citizenship, I guess might be one way to think about it. A lot of modern feminists now claim that capitalism hurts women. They claim that capitalism leads to inequality and it harms women more than it harms men. Some of them are even taking the argument to an extreme stance and pointing to the communist era as a good time for women, as a great time for women's equality. There was a whole series in the New York Times not long ago about just that. Of course, this kind of seems like nonsense, and these revisionist accounts usually omit the fact that communist regimes engage in extreme social engineering and they work their people to, well, to the death sometimes, you know. Um, how do yeah. you explain this blindness that many feminists have to communism? Oh, if I had an explanation for the attractions of communism, I, I would be making a lot more money than I, I do now. What I can do, I can't, I can't explain it. I can give you a couple of potential antidotes or at least counter narratives to, for people to consider um, when they make these arguments about capitalism being dangerous for women and destructive for women. Um, And the first one I want to point you to is the life of Madam CJ Walker. I watched Um, the Netflix series about that. I was just (laughs) going to ask if you had watched uh, self made yet. Um, which absolutely has to be watched. Um, C.J. Walker, uh, for your for your listeners who don't know, is uh, uh, the the first uh, self made um, uh, female uh, uh, entrepreneur in the United States. She's an African American um, who uh, ran her own uh, hair care supply company in Indianapolis and later in New York. So she's a very big deal here in Indianapolis and is starting to get a lot more attention outside, um, outside of the city and outside of the state. Um, her story is a, inc- an incredibly important and true narrative about the power of economic independence for one individual and for a community. Um, and I don't, I don't think it can be overstated. Um, the the significance of that story and of that kind of story. Um, there are some great fictional representations of um, women achieving um, uh, a greater liberty through economic power. Um, and I'd point you to uh, short stories by Edna Ferber. 
um, and uh, to a great novel uh, by a little known novelist named Dorothy Whipple, which has to be the most English novelist name <laughs> ever. Whipple. Um, and the title of that novel is High Wages. Um, I, which I know your, your reading list just keeps getting longer and longer. I do this to everybody, Juliet. Well, I definitely will be reading those and I'll be putting them to the top of my list. So I will read them very soon. So great. I hope you get back with me about them I, because then we can talk about I them. definitely will. So finally, you work for Liberty Fund. My understanding is that you and your colleagues spend a lot of time reading the great books and literature from all over the world. My understanding is that you guys also invite scholars to come to conferences to eat food, enjoy company, and discuss books. That sounds awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about what you guys do? Um, well, that's a pretty good description of what we do. Um, in addition to the conferences that we run at Liberty Fund, which sadly are currently in abeyance because of uh, the, the COVID crisis, which has you... Uh, podcasting from home rather than from whatever exotic locale you may usually podcast from. Um, we also have a series of websites um, that I think are very important. We have the Online Library of Liberty, which is a library of uh, books and documents that we think are important in the history of liberty. We have the Library of Economics and Liberty, um, which features blog posts and uh, interviews and the incredibly popular Econ Talk uh, podcast. Um, and uh, currently I'm doing a three-part series over there reading through um, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of a, a wonderful kind of stew of economic thought and thinking over there. We also have Adam Smith Works which is a website de dedicated to the life and work of Adam Smith. And we have the Library of Law and Liberty, which presents issues in law and jurisprudence and constitutional considerations. Um, they all have uh, active sort of, uh, interviews, podcasts, all sorts of material that, that I would urge everybody to look at. We also publish books that are worth exploring. And our job at Liberty Fund is to make all that content happen and find ways to get it into the hands and the heads of people who will make good use of it. That sounds so interesting. Thank you so much. This was a great talk. And to all my listeners, go read everything that Sarah has written and go check out all the books that she recommended and the Liberty Fund websites because there's a lot of information for you to explore and you know, widen your horizons. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me.